Think of it not as a building or a courthouse. Think of it as a ship on dry land, docked there. It's got its own maritime flag. So when you enter a courthouse, you're really entering a ship, and you're really trespassing. They can charge you with trespassing as soon as you enter, and you can be sentenced. You can be charged with trespassing, and they'll sentence you to probation for it or fine you or whatever. And you think you might have trespassed on somebody else's property. Maybe you were walking on the mall or you were crossing someone's lawn, but they're really charging you with trespassing because you entered their foreign vessel that's dry docked in your country. As soon as you go into that courtroom, that you've left your country and you've gone into their foreign vessel. And then they start using words of art against you. And you're not on a level playing field. The judge is sitting up off of the playing field in a box. You know, when you play soccer, basketball, football, baseball, the umpires, the referees, they're all on the level playing field. Everything is a level playing field, and you're operating under the rules of the game. Well, in the courtroom, the judge is up off of the playing field. The, the jury box is up off of the playing field. And there's a, that means there's a discontinuation of evidence. And there's not even a stenographer in there taking notes and making a legal record of anything that transpired in the court. So when you go in there and they ask you, do you understand the charges against you? They're not asking you if you understand English and you know what they're saying. They are speaking in legal English, and the word understand means do you stand under and take responsibility for these charges that we are getting, that we are charging against you? And the prosecutor will say, yes, Your Honor, this, this individual did such and such. Now, why do they say individual? Because that is one of those legal terms that puts you under their jurisdiction. So I was explaining all of this to them and how this whole thing is just a fraud. The judge is sitting up there in a box off of the level playing field wearing a black robe because he's mourning justice, and they are dragging you in there in handcuffs against your will, charging you with trespassing, and they're stealing your time and your energy from you. So at all costs, never, ever enter a courtroom or a courthouse because you're trespassing, and they're just going to screw you. So ignore them. All you do is you file the paperwork and you tell them that you are not under their jurisdiction. You do it by, what you have to do is you file your paperwork, you glue it together in the top left corner with glue, all the pages. That actually makes it a document. You put a stamp on it. That is your flag. You autograph through the flag. I mean, autograph, I mean you autograph. You print your name in blue ink. That makes it a wet signature and you print it. If you sign something, that invalidates it. It makes it null and void because the signature actually curses the page upon which it is written. And we've been trained to sign things. Don't sign things. Autograph them in blue ink. And then you dock your document in their, in their vessel. So it's all maritime, admiralty, legal English proceedings. And I highly recommend that if you want to become an expert on this, that whoever's listening, go to YouTube and look up Federal Judge David Wynn Miller. And Wynn is W-Y-N-N, -N, David Wynn Miller. He will teach you even more than I can even get into because he talks about the proper syntax of the way you put your information together on your claim, on your document, how to dock it. How do, you know, what happens when you even get a, a mortgage for your, for your house? You know, Gary, when you go buy your house... <laughs> It's, it's a sham. They, they take your, your application and they bring it over to a treasury window and they take your $500,000 that you're getting your loan for out of your treasury account. They bring it and they put it in their bank. They create $5 million out of that $500,000. Now they can lend $4.5 million because then they take that $500,000 back after they've made $500,000, $5 million off you. They bring your $500,000 back to the treasury window cancel the three-day, cancel the uh, um, loan because of the three-day rescission law, and then they make you pay on that loan that you never really paid on. It's a big fraud. You can learn this stuff from David Wynn Miller. So basically, somebody it's could... Great. Yes, so some basically, they could probably get out of their mortgage, uh, from what I gather, what you're saying. They, they That would be a way, that has to be a way to then... If the, 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 the contract is voided, then you don't owe it. Correct. But no one's going to answer to that. 
my mother was trying to get a loan. My mom's in her 80s now, and she can't really drive, so she asked me to drive her to the bank because she was getting a loan because um, she owns a couple of warehouses that she rents out, and the roof needed to be fixed. And so she wanted to get a $10,000 loan to fix the roof because it was time for this field to be done. It was 20 years old on the uh, barrier on top of the roof. So I took her to the bank, and we were sitting there at the counter, and I was in my mind, I was saying, I just need to be polite to these people. I'm not going to ask any questions. My mom's just here to get the loan. I'm just her driver today. So I was sitting there. And, you know, banks are not allowed to lend out their depositors money. If you deposit $100 into the bank, they're not allowed to lend that $100 that you deposited out to some, you know, someone who's in there trying to get a loan. And I know this. This is basic information. But I wanted to test this, these bankers to find out if they would be honest with me. So I... Um, so I was just sitting there, and I said, oh, and I was very nice. I was like, oh, it was these two older elderly ladies. And I said, may I ask you a question? I just had a quick question. I was kind of getting into financing, and I was looking at banking, and I thought it was really interesting, and I just was trying to clear up some information. Is it, are you guys, um, if I deposit five, you know, when you, when you lend out money, are you allowed to lend out your depositor's money? Like, you know, if I deposit $5,000 and someone borrows the money from your bank, or, are you... Yeah, are you allowed to lend out my money to them? And they said, oh, yeah. So she smiled at me, and she's, yep, yep. And then she was, like, blowing me off. And I was like, well, wait a second. Um, let me ask you something. Do you know the difference between money and the, do you know what a negotiable instrument is? And she's like, uh, no, I'm sorry. I don't know what you're talking about. So these are just basic terms I was asking her. I was just testing to see if she was even willing to have a real conversation and divulge any information because I wanted to see how closed and secretive it is. And it is. It's secretive. This happy, nice, elderly lady, dressed very nice, smelling nice, wearing her makeup, perfect hair, designer clothes, Gucci purse, nice pen, is just lying to my face with a smile, a, a, a smile as if she's my best friend. And I was so, and I smiled back, and I was like, okay, and I was just seething inside because I wanted to stand up and point my finger at her and tell her, you're a liar. You're part of the problem. I know what's really going on here, but I didn't because I wanted my mom to get the loan. So that's how bad it is at every level. You, you know, no matter what you do, even when I contacted Pam Bondi, the attorney general of Florida, and told her this fraud is going on, they have to accept it. It's, mis it's a felony. Misconduct in public office. I want to file charges. She said, I refuse to discuss promissory notes with you. I have the email. I will send it to you. I will send it to anybody who emails me. It's, it's, it's scary. It's ridiculous. I, I just, it's just wicked and criminal and evil, and I'm angry about it. Well, I would be. Now, also, the last time I, you were on the show, you were having problems with a police department over uh, trespassing where you ended up in jail? You, whatever happened about yeah, that? Yeah, I did. Well, I have, since then, I submitted my um, case. I put together my legal documents, and I'm still waiting about another two weeks before I contact them because I want to find out when my court date is. What I did was, um, I did what I said that I just told you are listening on this to do. When you... When you file a claim, you have to bind it properly, you glue it together, you stamp it and autograph through it. And what happened is, is I understand, you know, that I have the right to remain silent. And I made a movie, a uh, documentary called True Stories, A Lifetime of UFO Abductions. Um, a good friend of mine who I've known my whole life, who is my baseball coach, he actually manages... Um, the baseball fields here. He operates the baseball teams, runs the umpire leagues. He's uh, in the Space Coast Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, he's good friends with like San Francisco Giants head coach Bruce Bocci and or manager. So I interviewed him because he was he told me about having missing time where he had been abducted um, or had missing time like hours of, of missing time throughout his life where. He had family members see him come away from a spaceship that left their property, and he's had a lot of different things. And and um, and so I kind of believe that there's a joint alien military genetic modification program going on, and that's a different story. So I did an interview with him, and I have a um, it's like a, a hour and a half documentary interview 
of his situation and what has happened with him, and I have it up on Amazon Prime. It's called True Stories, Episode 2, A Lifetime of Alien Abductions. So I printed out some of those DVDs, and I was at the Augusta Mall in, in Augusta, Georgia, in Richmond County, and I was handing them out, and I was talking to people because there, there's high traffic there. So security came up to me, and they were like, hey, you have to leave. And I said, okay, but, uh, you know, I'm not doing anything wrong. And they were like, well, what's your name? And I said, I don't have to tell you my name. I have the right to remain silent. Um, I, I'm just going to leave. And they, then they arrested me. And I said, you can't criminalize me for uh, remaining silent. I don't have to tell you my name. And my wife at, at the time was there, and they forced her to tell them my name. They handcuffed her and said, if you don't tell him... Are you laughing? Well, I'm still here. Yeah. So they forced um, they forced her to tell them my name. So she did. But when I got to the jail, I wouldn't tell them my name, and I wouldn't allow them to fingerprint me. They wouldn't let me speak to a lawyer or anything for like five days until I told them my name. And finally, after they ch- chained me to a chair for 12 hours, freezed me, they put me in a room with like, no, basically shorts and a t-shirt, and they turned the temperature down to like 59 degrees, and I was freezing. For five days, I did not sleep, and I did not eat, and because they kept coming into my cell and saying, are you ready to have your picture and fingerprints taken? Are you ready to have your picture and fingerprints taken? And I kept telling them, no, they're my biometrics. You, you can't use them against me. Those are mine. Uh, I'm not giving them to you. And then they just kept slamming the door in my face. And, then, you know, and they kept, and I was pounding on the window, please, I need to talk to a lawyer. I need to speak to a doctor. I'm getting hypothermia. They would bring in, like, Wonder Bread sandwiches and a box of juice or a little bag of juice, and I would empty out the bags and fill it up with the hot water from my fountain that was in there. And there was cameras in there and just an open toilet seat. So I had to go to the bathroom on camera. I was trying to keep myself from freezing. I would take the food out, and I laid it on the bench, and I was trying to lay on the food so that I could, because I wouldn't eat it, because it was just disgusting, and I and I was trying to keep warm, like at least lay down and get some sleep without my body heat draining into the cement bench that was in this jail cell. So finally, after five days, the captain of the place, Captain Captain um, uh, Williams, um, he um, came in and he's like, "Why are you giving my my security guys a hard time? You won't let them take your picture and fingerprints." And I said, because they're my biometrics, they're just going to use them against me, and they're my biometrics. I'm not giving them up. They're mine. They belong to me. I don't have to give them to you. I want to speak to a lawyer. And then he's like, yeah, you know, I said, I'll tell you what. I'll give you my picture and fingerprints for $2,500 in cash right now. And if you don't pay me right now, it's another $2,500 per minute until you pay me. And so he looked at me, and he turned around and walked out. Because that was my conditional acceptance. I conditionally accepted his offer. In, in the law... When you get an offer, you can either accept it, conditionally accept it, or say no. And when you say no, you go into dishonor. And then that's an arrestable offense. If I had said no, they could have just kept me there indefinitely, but I conditionally accept it. Or you can just accept it and say, okay, I'll give you my picture and fingerprints, whatever you want. I just need to get warm. I need, I need to eat. I need to sleep. But I didn't. I was, I was angry, and I knew what I was doing, and I had been researching this. So I conditionally accepted his offer. And I gave him that amount. He walked out. And they didn't get me. And for another, like, 36 hours, I was in there until I finally said, yeah, take my picture and fingerprints, but you guys owe me money. And it's been accruing at $2,500 a minute since then. So they took my picture and fingerprints. And I signed, um, when, I, when I signed for my prints, I didn't sign them. I autographed and I said, under duress. And then they took me to another cell where I warmed up and um, I went to the court. I went to court and made a court appearance. And so I walked in there in chains, and when I went in there, I had to face a a female judge, a Judge Booker. And she came in, and I was the last case that they heard, because I knew that I was last, because they probably knew I was going to say what I was going to say or something like what I was going to say, and I don't think they wanted any of the other people to hear it. So the judge came in, and the first thing she said is, do you understand the charges and I said, I, no, I don't. I don't understand the charges. I don't even understand who you are, because I'm not going to take responsibility for you being some judge. And I said, and the Superior Court of the State of Georgia is now open and in session, and it is my wish that you remove these chains from me immediately. And she stopped the proceedings, and she said, 
have him have a psychiatric evaluation and I order him to have a prosecutor, uh, a public defender. And I didn't want a public defender. When